All right. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'm Ben. I'm going to talk about finding product market fit with data. Um, a quick bit uh, about myself. So I, uh, if you want, the sort of this talk is a lot of stuff drawn from a blog. This is kind of the vibe of that blog. Um, but kind of more importantly for this talk, I am one of the founders of a company called Mode. Mode is a BI tool built for data teams. It looks like this. Uh, it also looks like this. This is kind of the visualization draggy droppy BI stuff. Um, and here are some of our customers. Uh, so uh, these are some folks uh, that use the product today. Um, but obviously this is not like what Mode was like in the early days. Uh, this has taken some time for us to build. Uh, back in the early days, this was actually Mode's first product. Uh, it didn't look like all that fancy stuff. It looked like this. Um, and instead of having any customers, we had this. These were the other two co-founders of Mode, uh, one of whom is here and talking in like 40 minutes later. Uh, so check them out. Um, but anyway, so the, the point here was generally like where Mode is today obviously is not where we started. Uh, and there were some like rough moments along the way that took us some time to, to get there. Uh, and so this is actually a message from the, one of those other co-founders uh, back when things weren't doing so great uh, that said, hey, you know what? I don't actually think things are looking so good. Uh, I don't think that Mode has product market fit right now. Uh, and so this was, like, this was like what the world was like uh, back before some of the stuff that we built and, and some of these customers we had. Um, and, and this was like kind of that, that world. So this is kind of a, a very basic graph of what product market fit is like prior to product market fit. Everything sucks. You get messages like this from Josh. Uh, after product market fit, everything seems good. Um, and so the question really to talk about here is how did things get better? Like what is it that, that got us from the left side of that graph to the right side of that graph? Uh, and how do we actually figure out where we were before uh, to get to, to where we are now? Um, so I'm going to talk about two main reasons uh, and two kind of big things to think about as you're trying to do this. Uh, one of those reasons is figuring out what people like. This is kind of obvious, but I want to talk about like, some ways that you can do this a little bit. Uh, and second is figuring out when to actually start scaling. Um, that finding product market fit isn't just a matter of saying, hey, what do we need to build? But it's also timing it right. Uh, and so I want to talk about that a little bit too. So uh, to get things started, we can talk about this finding traction bit. Uh, and to talk about that, actually, I'm not going to talk about mode. I'm going to talk about a different company that y'all are all probably familiar with but aren't necessarily aware that you're familiar with, uh, which is a company called The Knot. Um, so they actually had an office, I think, in this building uh, for some period of time. Um, but what The Knot is, is it's a, it's a website for building websites for your wedding. So if you've had a friend get married uh, and you go to websites like this, like DanielleLoveSharon.com or whatever, uh, that are like your friend's wedding websites, uh, the Knot is the, the vendor that hosts these. Uh, and so when people want to be able to set up these websites, they can go to The Knot. It helps them set up things like registries. It helps them set up, you know, here's how to RSAP for all these things, that kind of stuff. Uh, and The Knot is, is the service that does that. And so The Knot was one of Mode's early customers. Um, when they first started using Mode, they had actually recently just released a mobile app. Uh, so they had this kind of main website builder, but they also wanted to have a mobile app for people to be able to do the various things they, they need to do to plan their wedding and that kind of stuff. Uh, and that was, that was this app, the 133rd most popular app in the lifestyle section of the app store. Um, when they released it, it didn't like do so hot. Uh, it was something that was not terribly popular. Um, it was a really important initiative for them to figure out, hey, like, this is what we think of as the future of our business. We need to be able to figure out how to get people to, to do this sort of stuff on mobile as well as on the website. Uh, and so how do we build that? And this app didn't, did not have sort of product market fit when they, they initially launched it. Their first set of experiments were basically like build a bunch of features, go look at how they're used on something like Google Analytics, see if they work. If they don't, try again and kind of like rinse and repeat. That it was basically the just iterative process of build features, see what happens, build features, see what happens, build features, see what happens. Um, it didn't really go anywhere. The, they, that, the app basically stayed stuck where it was and it never actually got popular. And so what ended up happening was one of the, the folks who was the, the like head of their data team uh, started poking around how people were actually using the existing app. Uh, and he made this chart. This was a chart that he made in Mode. Uh, the specifics here kind of don't matter that much. But basically, you can imagine each one of these kind of further out rings is, is people sort of progressing through different stages of, of the website. So the green bar might represent the home page. The purple bar might represent the registry page, whatever. And so it sort of tracks the different patterns of how people are moving through, through the site. And so he made this chart just to kind of see how this behavior looked. Uh, and the thing that he noticed was this down here, uh, which was this very kind of strange brown spike. 
of like, hey, why are people continuing to come back to the same, same page over and over and over again? They're consistently doing it. Like, what's the deal with, with going on here? Seems like there might be some pattern here to pay attention to. And what it turns out is it was this page. It was a page that was like a countdown for your how long until your wedding. Uh, that it was a single page that said, hey, you're going to get married in 86 days, in 85 days, in 84 days. Um, and people kept coming back to it day in and day out, like taking screenshots of it and then like sending it to their friends or posting social media on social media or whatever. And this was like a kind of small thing that they built. They didn't think it really mattered when they first built the app. But in putting it together, they realized like this was how people were actually using it. This is the thing that people wanted to do. And by looking at that, that chart and kind of following the behavior of what users were doing, they actually started leaning into this behavior and built out what is this, which is where it looks better. You can add these photos. It was easy to share on social media. Um, and actually, the app started to take off because of it. They really like, leaned into the way that people were using it rather than trying to force them to do, do the things they originally wanted them to do. Another example of this is a company called Bourbon. Um, this may be an example some people are familiar with. Uh, this was like Foursquare for Bourbon. You would go somewhere, you would drink bourbon, you would take a picture of it, you would check in, you say, I had this bourbon, I liked it. Um, turns out nobody really wanted to do that. Uh, the, the, the people who like, were doing this actually didn't really care about the check-in stuff. They just like take pictures of their bourbon. Uh, and so the app was like, hey, wait a minute, maybe we'll just have more picture-sharing stuff instead of bourbon check-in stuff. So they changed their name from bourbon to Instagram, uh, and that's now like how Instagram actually got started. Was Again, this was not the point of the original product. The point of the product was to, I guess, like have social networks around bourbon. Uh, but they saw this other kind of latent behavior that they followed. And so what ends up happening a lot of times in early stages of products is something like this. Uh, where you'll spend a whole bunch of time building these features, and you'll have like some small gimmick in the corner, and the small gimmick in the corner is the thing that people are actually excited about. Uh, and so when you're like looking for product market fit, this is actually probably the best thing you can do is pay attention to like, what are your girls in the red dress uh, that everybody's actually distracted by when you're trying to get them to, to build the thing or do the things you want them to do. Um, the part of this, though, that's kind of important is that and people have probably all seen this. This is basically the same as, as this, of like, okay, you can design a thing and people will do something else. The thing is, like, in SaaS apps, there is no actual physical path that you can see. You can't actually see, like, the worn down grass on the dirt. Um, you have to be able to track this in some other way. This is something that is only sort of materializes in your data. It only shows up in stuff like this. Um, and so really, like, the, the job of us and, as early stage founders or as early stage product folks is to pay a lot of attention to this to try to do the best we can to kind of recreate that, that grass pattern uh, in the data that we have and the behaviors that we see to be able to see what are those places that people are actually like cutting the shortcuts in, in the path. Uh, and the more that you do this, the more you pay attention to this, like the faster you can find these paths. Uh, and that's a really big part of, of what this job here is, is kind of more than anything, as, as Andrew Chen says, who's a guy who talks a lot about product market fit stuff, um, really the job here is to reduce the time to do this. Eventually you will see these things if you build the app long enough, you build your products long enough, some things will emerge that are the kinds of behaviors that people follow. Somebody will just tell you them. Um, but the more you look at the data and kind of the more you're looking for these anomalies, the faster you'll be able to find this and, and the better off you'll be. Uh, and there's a reason that speed matters, which is there's actually sort of another line on this chart. Uh, this isn't the only line that really matters. Uh, there's also a line here of like how much money you have left as a business. Um, and so like if this takes too long, this money line basically goes to zero. Uh, it also, if you like, start to try to scale the business too quickly, this money line will go to zero a lot faster, which kind of leads to the second problem of, okay, once you sort of find these interesting patterns, once you find these things that, that might be places of sort of markers of product market fit, how do you decide actually when to scale? Uh, and for some people, actually, this is the bigger problem than finding the interesting kind of elements of what people like. Uh, so this is a, one of the kind of the famous growth VPs from Facebook who basically said, actually, the bigger problem that startups have isn't necessarily finding these things, but it's identifying when they have it rather than like, hey, we had early signs of something. We think that's good enough. Uh, we're ready to scale when you're actually not, not where you think you are. Uh, and so to use another, another kind of mode example, uh, this is an actual graph of our marketing spend, sort of anonymized by month uh, and with some numbers wiped out. Um, but you can all kind of see the problem here, which is this giant green mountain of wasted money. Uh, this was also the time that Josh was like, hey, things don't look so good right now. <laughs> um, and basically, this was us finding, thinking we'd found product market fit, and we hadn't. That we thought we had found something that worked. We thought it was time to scale, to spend more money on ads and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it turns out, kind of obviously, we didn't. Um, and so then our like, money left line, if we draw that over this, would look like this. Uh, the zero is not the same, like zero is down here. But still, uh, that's not the chart that you want to see. 
So uh, the question then is like, okay, how do you know when you're ready? Like, how do you actually know that it's time to start spending more on marketing or scaling the product uh, as opposed to, to, you know, kind of continuing to develop and iterate? I, my initial answer to this, like probably around the time that we started spending all that money on, on uh, marketing was like, it's probably just retention. If people keep using your product, it's probably good. Like, that's good enough, right? That's what all the people say. Um, and so people have probably seen charts like this. This is from Mixpanel. Uh, basically, you know, like the number of people who come back after a certain number of days. Uh, if this number looks good, then great. Like you're ready to scale. If it doesn't, don't. Simple enough, right? Uh, so not really. So the, the example I want to call out, like why this doesn't actually work, uh, I want to draw a couple examples from, from two companies that you all may have heard of. Uh, one is Greenhouse and the other is Front. So Greenhouse is an applicant tracking system. Basically, if you like have job recs on your website, Greenhouse will power those. They will then help recruiters sort of usher candidates through the job process. Um, so they'll move people from one stage to the other. Candidate goes from an interview to an on-site to an offer, things like that. Uh, and so it's a management system for, for that and for recruiters. Uh, front is a shared inbox. Uh, it's basically for support teams to have a single inbox where people can email and multiple people in the, for the company can then respond to that email and see like, the conversations that everybody's having. And so for the next few slides, uh, I'm going to talk about these things using a graph that looks like this, which looks like a huge mess right now. Uh, but I can explain what it means in a much simpler version, which is this. Um, so basically, these, this is like looking at users in the days that they used a product. Uh, and so if you look at this first user, for instance, what this is saying is the user used the product on day one, on day two, and on day four. Um, or on day two, you can say that users one, three, four, five all used the product, but number two didn't. Um, or like if you look at an individual day, you can say, hey, this block represents user one using the product on, on day two. And what you can like pretty obviously kind of calculate from this is retention rates. Um, so on day one, all five of them used it, so it's 100%. Four out of five use it on day two, so it's 80%, kind of, and so on out, of where it's like 80, 60, 60, 40. Um, so basically, like if you then zoom back out of this, you can get a chart like this that shows the different patterns of how people are actually using the product. Um, and so this is a hypothetical. It's like me making it up of what Greenhouse may well look like. I don't actually know. Um, but, but you can imagine a pattern that looks like this for, for Greenhouse, uh, where people use it sporadically, like recruiters aren't logging in every day, people aren't progressing necessarily through uh, recruiting pipelines every day. Some of these people might be hiring managers that are only coming in when they actually have interviews, things like that. Um, so they have this kind of like sporadic pattern of, of returning. But on this chart, uh, if you look like 90 days after, like three months into this, actually 97% of these users still come back. So in the time between 90 and 120 days, there's actually 97% of these 200 users uh, are all still engaging with Greenhouse, which seems, seems pretty good. Um, so this is front. This is another version of this chart. Could represent the same thing. You can imagine these blocks mean the same thing. Uh, in front's case, it's very much intended to be a daily usage app. It's something that's supposed to be like you use it every day. It's like your email. Um, if you use your email every day, uh, or most people probably use their email every day. They aren't using it once a week or something like that. Uh, so in this case, though, if you draw the same line because of this usage pattern, uh, after three months, only 12% of these people are actually still using front. Um, so it's a very different sort of retention pattern, uh, a very different uh, group of people are using it. Uh, and in this case, you'd probably look at this and say, like, that doesn't look so good. So looking at these two charts, uh, on this top one from Greenhouse, you'd be like, okay, great, now it's time to expand, it's time to scale, let's go hire more salespeople, let's like jack up that marketing spend chart, all that stuff, like we have product market fit, it's all great. Um, for this chart, you'd be like, no, we're, we're not there at all. We have some few people who like it, we've sort of found maybe the, the like, path in the sand or the path in the, uh, in the grass that people are following, that a handful of these people really, really gravitate towards, but clearly this is a product that does not seem terribly sticky yet uh, and does not have product market fit. The problem here is, if you just look at daily retention rates for these two things, they will look exactly the same. Uh, that the way this math works out is these two things can actually show the exact same retention rates from a, on like a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, and really what that means is, is like that metric, even if that metric seems like a really good one, it hides all of these other patterns that may not actually show up in simple metrics like retention. And so the point here is uh, what Steve Blank says. Steve Blank is the uh, author of... Uh, Four Steps to the Epiphany, which is like the kind of one of the sort of canon of Silicon Valley kind of stuff. Basically, like these sort of one-size-fits-all approaches of like just use retention or just use certain metrics do not work for all startups. You have to really think about what it is that, that your startup needs. Um, and so what do you do instead of that? Basically define like what fit looks like for your very specific product. What does it mean for someone to use your product in the way that you intend them to use it or in the way they should be using it? Uh, and how would that actually show up in these sorts of retention metrics? 
So for instance, for greenhouse, uh, that may not look like just this three-month retention or daily retention. Um, it may actually be things like how many hires do they make? Um, this is actually, so both greenhouse, the reason I use greenhouse in front for these two things is they actually published uh, a study a bit back with, with one of these VCs saying, hey, these are the metrics they use to decide like, when to scale. And this is actually what they said. So it was like, okay, if we have a number of hires made, if that's staying steady, that's product market fit for us, that's a sign that we're ready to go. For front, um, they want users to be engaged early and often. Again, it's not a, a sporadically used app. It's an app you're supposed to use every day. Uh, the point here is to, to use it early and often. And so their definition of product market fit, their things that they looked at to see when it was time to scale, was how often are people sending messages in the first 30 days? That gets them past like the tire kicking phase of them logging on and sending a few messages in the first couple days, shows that they're kind of wanting to stick around, but it doesn't have to wait for months or years to see if they actually use it. So this was the metric they used. And so if you're thinking about these things, you're trying to say, okay, like, what's the metric for my business? How do I, how do I actually do this? Um, to kind of help brainstorm a handful of ideas from other businesses or people who thought about this. One, if you are a product that needs to be used every day, something like what front is makes sense. Um, things like DAUs over MAUs, uh, which effectively measures how many days in a month people are using your product, uh, is really important. A high number there matters. Um, so 50% they're using it, say, 15 days a week or 15 days a month is a really important kind of threshold. Similarly, if you're like a SaaS business um, that's selling B2B, Obviously, in that case, it usually follows much more of like a work week kind of pattern. Um, and so if people are using your product uh, more than four days a week, like how many percentage of your users are using it four days a week, shows that, hey, these are people for whom the product is really sticky and it's something that's really valuable. Um, if you are a product that has a lot of competition, uh, then something like a high NPS is a pretty good sign of product market fit because people have a lot of choices. Uh, you need to know that people are like, actually like your product. It's a thing that they want to use. It's a thing they will choose over the other alternatives they have. Um, NPS can actually be a pretty decent measure of that. Um, if your product is a vitamin and not a painkiller, so if your product is something that's kind of a nice to have, you want to actually see that people will be upset if they take it away. Um, so this is actually a metric that I think Superhuman used, the email client, um, where obviously people have email clients. That's very much a vitamin, not a painkiller to have that. So they wanted to check and see if people would be disappointed once they started using it if you take it away. Like, will I be upset about that? And if they're not, then people could probably walk away from it pretty easily. And the last one, if you're a product that's sort of an unknown demand, say you're trying something new, you have something that you don't actually know that, that uh, people will pay money for, in this case, you actually should see them paying money. You want to see things like revenue growth. Um, you want to see things like LTV over CAC, stuff like that, that demonstrates people actually put money where their mouth is. They're not just going to say, yeah, it looks great. We'll kind of keep using it. We'll actually pay for this and, and find real value in it. Um, so the, the last point I want to make on this uh, before kind of ending things with questions is this chart, I've shown this chart a number of times. Uh, I will say this chart is actually a lie. This is not what product market fit looks like at all. Um, it's a nice little graphic or whatever. Um, but in reality, as you're building businesses, product market fit looks much more like this, where it's this kind of iterative thing. You find it, and then you move to a different market. You try to market to a new segment. Um, you expand to selling to different types of customers, and you no longer have product market fit with those folks, and you have to find it again. Um, and so it's, a, it's like a sort of ongoing journey uh, to do this. This is not something where it's like you are pre and post product market fit forever. Um, you are pre and post product market fit for particular types of buyers, for particular products, for particular segments and all those sorts of things. So uh, these two things, it's not actually like these are the two things you have to figure out is what people like and what, when to scale. It's actually you have to constantly be figuring out uh, what it is that people will like next, uh, the people that you're trying to sell to, what's important to them next. And figure out when to scale further. So like, how do you keep moving up that chart um, when you're ready to move to a new market, to a new product, to a new segment, all those sorts of things. It's an ongoing part of, of continuing to build a startup. So uh, that's where I'll stop. Uh, if you want anything more from me, this is the Twitter and the Substack, and you can also just search for my name on LinkedIn. It'll show up, or you can go to bin.work. Um, that's it. Oh, that's not, that doesn't say questions. Uh, cool. I'll stop there, and if there are questions, I can answer questions. All right, work. Thank you.